Warm welcome. Emphasis being on warm. Uh, we'll have a few hymns, which uh, may or may not know. And uh, after that, who's doing the lesson tonight? Is it? Oh, it is Hashem. Okay, yep. All right. Our first hymn will be 528. And I think we're singing first, second, and fourth. All righty. <clears throat> I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life He gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know. I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word, in thought, in deed. Then I His holy face may see when from this earth life freed. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands, most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. Next hymn is 643. <clears throat> Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, bright and are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday's glare? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at the last? home. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the still and solemn way? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, for a harvest pure <clears throat> white? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, all along the fertile way? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom? Brother, you must reap at the last great day. For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home? Is that it? <clears throat> uh, 
456, 456. Is this first, second, and third? First and third. <clears throat> As I journey here mid the toil and tears, there's a rainbow in the cloud. He will safely lead, I must have no fear. There's a rainbow in the cloud. There's a rainbow that is shining. There's a rainbow in the cloud. When last race is run and the victory's won, there's a rainbow in the cloud. When the storm's all past comes a brighter day, there's a rainbow in the cloud. In that city fair, there's a crown to wear. There's a rainbow in the cloud. There's a rainbow that is shining. There's a rainbow in the cloud. When life's race is run and the victory's won, there's a rainbow in the cloud. Thank you. Um, let's have a word of prayer before handing over to Hashem. Holy Father and mighty God, we thank you that we can come before you this evening and learn more from your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can, be, that we can begin this evening by singing praises to you, by singing songs and hymns that remind us of the glory that awaits us, of the comfort that we have in you, of the joy that we have in you. Father, we thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ and that through your Son and our Savior we have every spiritual gift and blessing and it is in his name that we are able to be here together as a family. Not just any family, Father, but a family that will be and will live together for all eternity. And as we consider that, and your presence, and your love for us, and your goodness, and your forgiveness. I pray, Lord, that you help us to grow in our love for each other, our understanding of each other, our working with each other, and our walking with each other. Thank you, Father, that we are able to be here together, to see each other. And I pray, Lord, that as we hear from your word, we will grow together, and that we will be enriched and encouraged and strengthened to face this world to grow in our faith, Father, to speak openly and unashamedly of the fact that you created us and you sent your Son to teach us your truth and ultimately to be the perfect sacrifice that we can be with you in glory. We pray, Father, for that day when you return with your Son, Jesus Christ, to collect your faithful. Father, until that day, I pray that we be faithful, that we continue to walk faithfully and that we grow in this endeavor. And I pray, Father, until that day and in all things, that your will be done. Thank you for your patience with and love for man. And I pray that we have the same love for the souls of the men and the women out there looking for truth. And that we, this love of ours, overcome potentially fear that we may have. And that this love and faith that we have uh, be a light to this world. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Very good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, evening's Bible class on the continuation on the series of lessons from the book of Matthew, chapter 5. And uh, we'll be doing verse uh, 27 onwards today. <clears throat> uh, 
right up to verse uh, 30 for today. So from verse 27 to verse um, 30, all right? <clears throat> and um, as you can see, and if you've, you've gone home and read from last week, uh, the, from, the, uh, from verse 26, you can know, and the title even says, uh, is something to do with adultery and adultery um, in the heart. And that is the subject matter that Jesus uh, is uh, <clears throat> going through in these verses from verse 27 to verse um, 30. So last week, um, we saw how Jesus used the idea of going to the heart of man instead of the mechanical aspects of things when it comes uh, to things pertaining to the law and keeping of the law, that is the Mosaical law, the Old Testament law. And then we see the example that Jesus used uh, from verse 21 to verse 26 when he equated um, anger or hatred towards uh, your brother um, and equating it uh, to, to the same as murder in keeping the law of thou shalt not uh, murder. And that is an example of which Christ used, uh, verse 21, verse 26, uh, to explain what he meant in verse 20 when he said that unless your righteousness exceeds of, of the righteousness of, uh, the, of the Pharisees and the scribes, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. <clears throat> and then we see now the following verses from verse 27 to verse 30. Jesus then now used the law regarding adultery and uh, applied it to the heart just like how he did regarding um, anger and murder uh, in the previous section in verse 21 to verse 26. So we see here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to verse 30, it says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, <clears throat> You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman uh, to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for, all, for your whole body to be cast into hell. So, as we can see now here that Jesus is applying um, the, uh, the, um, or just going through the uh, law of adultery. Uh, when he begins by saying in verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. So just like before, in verse uh, 21, Jesus opened up with a statement uh, saying as such, right? And But now, Jesus deals uh, with what they heard regarding the law, which is the law of adultery. Now, Jesus himself, you know, supported the uh, Jewish teaching of the day, that physical act of murder is sinful, so likewise the physical act of uh, adultery uh, is sinful. And his listeners will be very familiar with the seventh commandment, uh, that is, you shall not commit adultery. You can see that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and verse uh, 18. And adultery is sinful under the law of Moses, and also we can see it is sinful under the new covenant that we live in, that is the law of Christ. And it is a serious matter, so serious in fact, that the act of adultery is punishable by physical death under the Old Testament law. For example, in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10, it says, if a man <clears throat> commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put um, to death. And then we see in a different passage, in, um, sorry, and then we see it is also punishable in the old, new covenant that we live in, that is uh, not just not physical death, like how the old covenant is, or was, I should say. In a new covenant, we see that the spiritual death ensued, which is actually worse than physical death, if you ask me. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, and the list goes on. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, it says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we see, you know, adultery or the act of adultery, the sin of adultery is um, one that is, uh, you know, um, put forth to us in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament context, um, you know, both leading to, in the Old Testament, physical death and the New Testament, spiritual death, which is, you know, the worst uh, of the uh, two. And as like before, you know, Jesus took the command against adultery further than what the old covenant did and applied it beyond just the physical act, but also takes into account the hearts of men 
And we can see that in verse 28 when he says, But I say to you that whoever looks at the, at the woman to last for her has already committed adultery with her um, in his heart. Very similar to what we saw regarding um, murder which begins in the heart, that is anger and murder, how Jesus equate the two. We see here Jesus equate, you know, not only just the mechanical aspect of it is considered sin, but rather the thoughts, your heart, what you think, what you see, what you do internally in your mind also counts to that um, degree. And that is what Jesus is doing here uh, in verse 28. You know, interestingly enough that some, you know, Jewish rabbis of the day, according to one of the commentators, Lightfoot, um, regarded the physical act as sinful, but they somehow or other made, you know, um, the section of lust, that is anything that happens in your mind, um, allowable, meaning that the only the physical act of adultery really counts. Whatever else that happens before that, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, you know, there were some um, sections of the Jewish rabbi that believed and taught that that is the case. And then we see, you know, how Jesus then deals with this in, in the sense that, you know, Jesus uh, takes the uh, law and interprets it in his uh, correct uh, manner as how Jesus has done. So this passage deals with the sin of adultery and equates lust as being part of it. Therefore, the sin of lust, like all others, you know, must be killed at the source. Because the lustful look can lead to a lustful act. So what is Jesus' prescription then um, to this particular problem? We can see that in verse 29 and verse 30 when it says, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you to, that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast um, in hell. So we see you know, Jesus' uh, drastic measure uh, or, or prescription to the problem of lust, the problem of adultery. So then the question becomes this. So this means what? We cannot look at a woman, and likewise, you know, a woman cannot look at the man. I mean, if you think about it, right, um, um, you know, when you, were, you, you as a, uh, I as a guy look at a, look at a girl, and then um, if, you know, uh, certain uh, things that can come to mind, then that's it, right? That's pretty much it, condemn under the law, right, in that sense. Uh, likewise, you know, if a woman would look at, look at a, a guy and have, you know, certain thoughts, that's it, right, condemn under the law. So then the question becomes, if Jesus' then prescription is to pluck out your eye, if, he, if that's the case, then we should pluck out all our eyes, we should pluck out, you know, every single senses so that we won't be subjected to that uh, particular uh, thing or the particular manner. So is that what Jesus is really um, talking about? Is that what Jesus is really, um, you know, putting forth here? In a sense that, you know, you, if you really want to be pure, if you really want to be righteous in the sight of God, it's best to not have any senses at all. Then you know you're safe, right? Um, because in that, in that regard, you won't be able to, you know, last or, you know, have uh, physical emotions, uh, so to speak. But of course, you know, um, if you were to go through the passage, you know, that is not what Jesus is really um, saying, like literally in that sense. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there are some um, cases that, you know, certain people in times past did take it as literal, and we'll uh, see that in a second. Now, if you go through uh, in terms of the uh, verse itself, when it says, But I say to you that whoever looks at the woman, and that Greek word for looks, right, is actually um, it is a Greek word that comes, uh, which, which is actually translated as blep. I actually Googled this, but I just forgot how it actually pronounced. But anyways, that's the Greek word that's being used uh, to translate as the uh, word looks, right? And it's not just, um, you know, um, it is not just an indication of the act of looking, um, like a natural thing that is done. So like, for example, I'm just looking right now, that is not what it actually meant. It actually goes further uh, to, than that. It actually indicates a continual process of looking. Um, in, in, in other words, a sustained intentional stare. That is what that word looks actually mean, meant from that Greek word that is being uh, translated. And this involves an in context, that is, because if you think about it, in context, Jesus is talking about looking at a woman uh, to lust. So if you are intentionally uh, staring at that person, continually in the process of looking at that person in context of lust, so it has to mean that it involves a lustful gaze, fantasizing and perhaps mentally engaging in illicit uh, thoughts. So that is what that word look in this particular context actually really meant. So just very much so like other passages in Scripture in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14 when it says, Having eyes full of adultery and, and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, 
They have a hard train in covetous practices and are cursed children. Yeah, in context, you know, in this particular passage, Peter, Apostle Peter was writing about uh, false teachers. But nevertheless, you know, we see how the eyes is being equated, you know, as having adultery, having eyes full of adultery. And in that sense, it gives us a perspective of what that word look and last really meant, is that staring to that particular degree. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it tells us, For all that is in the world, the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we see, you know, another thing here being equated uh, with lust, that is the flesh and the eyes. So the word here, look, is not just, you know, like naturally looking at something, but rather an intentional stare. Much like, you know, some of those, like, um, I remember old Chinese movies, you know, that, that they portray this, uh, this uh, what do you call that, um, perverted old man, they call it, right? And then usually the, the, uh, the thing that always, in, in a comedic sense, and the, and the thing that they always do is always that, that funny stare. You know, I, I guess it's something like that. Or, you know, staring to a degree that you are, you know, having and engaging in um, all these uh, illicit and lustful and fantasizing um, thoughts. So with this, we can see that Jesus is not condemning the natural desire of men for women or neither the natural desire for women for men. But the lustful desire here is the one that Jesus is talking about. The lustful desire for the woman to whom that person has no right for. And the most prominent example of adultery in the Old Testament involves who? David and Bathsheba, as you know. So when you, when you look at the example of David and Bathsheba and the uh, case of adultery that happens there, it begins with what? What did it begin with? I mean, we all know that, um, or, you know, if you've gone through Sunday school enough, we all know that it begins with uh, you know, David somehow or other you know, liking to walk on the roof. <laughs> and so happens to, uh, you know, to uh, spot Bathsheba having a, a, uh, a bath in that particular regards. But interestingly enough, in Scripture, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2 to verse 4, which we'll read in a sec, um, it actually begins with a gaze while Bathsheba was, uh, was having a bath. And what gaze do you think that's going to happen? So it has to be this, the same type of gaze or looks that Jesus is describing here in verse 28, a lustful one, is it not? Because we see here in uh, verse uh, 2 to 4 of chapter 11, he says, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. So we see, you know, the um, act of adultery begin when? Is it be is, did it uh, begin with the act itself, or did it begin with, um, you know, him walking on the roof, not walking on the roof, but rather when he was walking on the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to what? Behold. So in other words, he saw that woman, did not just, you know, like, just turn around and be like Joseph, flee away from that particular situation with Potiphar's wife. Rather, you know, he thought to himself, oh, that woman is very beautiful to behold. What do you think is going through David's mind in that particular regard? I can safely say that, uh, you know, thoughts, of uh, impurity, thoughts of adultery has already you know, been fomented at, at that particular point in time. So much so that the act of adultery just you know, came right after that. So in that regard, if you were to look at it, we see how Jesus here equating in verse 28 when he says, when he looks at the woman to last for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This you know, particular example you know, shows that that indeed is uh, true and what actually happened. And if you contrast this with Job's idea, uh, or you know, the idea that we find in Job, in Job chapter 31, verse 1, it says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Why, Job? In verse 9 to verse 12, it says, If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another, and let others bow down over her. For that will be wickedness. Yes, it will be, an, you will be iniquity deserving of judgment. For that will be a fire that consumes to destruction and will root out all my increase. So we see here Job affirm in verse 1 when he says, you know, I have made a covenant with what? My eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? The reason why he did that is so that he could guard his heart. Guard his heart from what? Verse 9 to verse 12 of the same particular chapter and book tells us that, you know, he was guarding his heart from being enticed. 
and refrain from putting himself in compromising positions um, that, you know, that unfortunately David uh, went through with uh, Bathsheba in the example uh, before. You know, this, goes, this shows to us that people are not objects to be used for our own gratification, be it mentally or be it physically in a physical sense. To misuse you know, um, sex constitutes a perversion of one of God's gifts uh, to us. Full enjoyment of se sexual expression can only be found by following God's command uh, regarding it. So that you know, segues to uh, a uh, side point that I just want to um, you know, talk about, the truth about sex. And it's one of the things that I read in one of the uh, commentaries. And I thought, oh yeah, it's actually really interesting as to um, you know, how this particular person um, you know, put his point forward. And I thought you know, it'd be good to uh, you know, share around while we're in this point of, um, you know, in time of the lesson. Let's ask a question. Is sex a dirty word? Is sex a dirty word? Or a dirty thing? You know, sometimes saying the word sex, it automatically gives us an impression of something that is... Uh, at least to me, you know, when I was younger, it's like sex, whoa. <laughs> Something that is, uh, you know, improper or to me, at least, you know, it's like, oh, you know, shouldn't, you know, be saying that thing. So, or some, something, you know, sort of like, um, um, not to say dirty, but something that is, you know, that's just uncomfortable with in that regards. Now, if you were to go back into the beginning of things, when God created man and, you know, woman, we see, you know, man as a sexual being was being provided a suitable companion for him. Is it not? Adam was being provided a suitable companion for him, and that is Eve. And when God made Adam and Eve in the beginning, what did God actually saw? He saw that it was good, very good indeed, and commanded them to multiply and fill the earth. Is it not? If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to verse 31, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our, in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the, sea, of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, that you sh that you that to you it shall it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that He made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth um, day. So we see, you know, here. Since the beginning of time, since the uh, creation um, days, we see that you know God created all this. So since God created sex, it cannot be something that's dirty. It cannot be something that you know that you know when you talk about it, it's like ooh, that gives you that that weird, um, uncomfortable uh, feeling. In other words, you know, sex in and of itself is not the original um, sin. You know, God knows that sex being used in the wrong context that, it also, that is outside the, um, the uh, context of marriage can be destructive to a person's physical, emotional, and definitely the person's spiritual uh, well-being. Therefore, you know, in the, because of this, God gave us rules to govern even down to our sexual expression, if you would. Now, we see that God originated the uh, husband and wife relationship in Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 to verse 25. It tells us, Then the rib of which Lord, uh, the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not a shame. So we see, you know, God originated the husband and wife relationship as part of the rules of which, you know, sexual expression then can be used. And we see, you know, his word in the New Testament endorses it. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God uh, will judge. God even included an entire book within his inspired word to teach us, you know, things about marital love. 
And that book is the least um, you know, amount of times that I actually went through uh, in the whole Bible, that is the Song of uh, Solomon. And his rules, uh, you know, that govern, um, his rules governing, sorry, uh, sexual behavior are definitely in our, in our best interest. We see, you know, the rules and the uh, laws and the commands regarding marriage and divorce and remarriage in Matthew chapter 19, verse 1 to verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 to verse um, 5. You see, brethren and, and friends, if you're viewing online, sex is not the problem. The real problem is the society that we live in here today is saturated with the abuse and exploitation of sex. The old adage, sex sells, right? And indeed, truly, um, that is the case because, you know, sex is sometimes used to sell anything from everything, from like toothpaste to cars to everything under the sun. You know, even that TV shows openly make fun of chastity. You know, that means, you know, keeping um, yourself pure until, you know, the point of marriage and joke about, you know, sexual promiscuity. Sexually ex explicit mov movies, music, books, target young audiences, advocating for, you know, perhaps hedonism in place of responsible sexual behaviors. Because of that, you know, this creates an environment that pressures young and Im impressionable people, immature people to believe that it is strange and truly indeed it's abnormal to not go along with the crowd, to have sexual freedom, if you would. And the result of, this, of which we can see, rising rates of uh, babies born out of wedlock, abortion, divorce, that happens. I mean, when I was in, in Malaysia, you know, things of this is quite taboo. At least when I was growing up, when I was a young, young kid. Not so much more now, but when I was young, you know, things like this is taboo. It's like, oh, how can you, you know, fall pregnant out of marriage? Oh, you know, you, you did this. Oh, you did that. And it's something that's shunned upon, right? And, um, you know, came here to the uh, more Western open society, if you would. Um, and you could see the difference in the sense of, you know, babies born out of wedlock, um, you know, the rate of divorce, uh, abortion becomes a, uh, a, uh, a particular uh, issue in that sense. Even, you know, the advertisements that warns against sexually transmitted disease. What is their prescription to avoid sexually transmitted disease? Safe sex, is it not? Why not abstain? Why not, if you don't want sexually transmitted disease, don't have sex outside of marriage? But rather, the, um, the point here is to advocate the practice of safe sex instead of absten abstaining. Now, the only true safe sexual practice is truly refrain from sex outside um, of marriage or before marriage. And marrying someone who is truly godly, morally upright with spiritual values. Then both partners, of course, must remain faithful to each other uh, within the marriage uh, institution. See, you know, sex is more than just a physical act. God designed it to involve the body, physical body, the mind, and the spirit. And to me, I thought it was really profound when I read all of this, the truth about sex. Isn't it true? And how something that is, can consider to be pure in the, you know, in the context of which we find it in scriptures, being twisted, used, abused in the world that we live in here today. So much so that um, you know, sometimes you know, talking about it, you feel a bit... Ugh, that feeling. Even now, I sometimes feel a bit. Mm. <laughs> I, I don't know how to explain that feeling, but it's that feeling of uncomfortableness uh, that comes with it sometimes. Now, going back to the passage, what is Jesus' recommendation to us? We read of that in verse 29 and verse 30, that is to maim yourself, right? You know, these verses at least shows to me that sin must be eliminated as a source, is it not? Because if the eyes causes you to lust, and therefore, the last that comes, you know, which is adultery in your heart, then therefore you take out the problem of that, um, of that uh, cause, right? That is to pluck out your eyes. If your hand causes you to steal, then get rid of that problem. Is it not cut off your hand? Why? Because it's better for one part of your member of your body to perish than for the whole entire body to perish into um, hell. And that's what Jesus said in verse 29 to verse um, 30. You know, does this mean that we literally must maim ourselves in order to, be, to cut off the sin that is produced in us? If the eye causes us to last, so pluck it out. If our hands cause us to steal, then cut it off. You know, unfortunately, you know, some um, you know, uh, took this statement that Jesus made as literal. 
Um, and a lot of commentators use this example of a certain brethren that lived in the uh, first century time um, or the early days of uh, Christianity named Oregon, uh, who is an early churchgoer and believer. He made himself an eunuch for the kingdom of God's sake based on Christ's teaching in Matthew chapter 19 and uh, verse 12. Now, if you look at it in context, Jesus is not commanding radical surgery as a solution, uh, but emphasizing the radical nature of his followers, of how his followers, his disciples, must get rid of, um, of sin in their lives. You know, the, the imagery here emphasizes the essentiality of taking whatever measures, whatever steps, whatever possible thing that you can do necessary to control the natural passions that tend to take control uh, sometimes of ourselves. Not only just in the, uh, uh, in the problem of lust and adultery, but also other problems that we see, the anger and um, other things that can come uh, with it. Now the trouble with literal interpretation of this particular passage in verse 20, 29 and 30 is that, you know, if you're to maim yourself for the sake of that regard, it's just not enough, right? Even if you cut off your hand, you still got another hand that you can steal things with. Even if you pluck out one of your eye, you still have the other eye to, uh, to, uh, to uh, sin with, is it not? Even when all of these things are gone, you still have what? The mind, the heart, is it not? And in the context that we find ourselves in, what is Jesus um, you know, trying to, um, trying to um, point out here? Is that it is not just the physical act that, you know, causes, that, that classifies as sin, but rather the things that comes from the mind as well. You know, and that is the point here in that the context of which the passage is found, um, you know, um, which, which um, you know, is found is an extension of the verse tw uh, that we found in verse 20, talking about righteousness that is uh, dealing with the hearts of men. And later, Jesus said that, you know, sin literally originates or comes from the heart of men. In Matthew chapter 15, verse um, 18 to verse 20, when he says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of, a, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, false, sorry, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So in this particular context in advance in Matthew chapter 15, we see that you know, Jesus literally comes straight forward that said that every evil thoughts and things, it starts from the heart. It does not start from that physical act that already has um, been uh, done or taken place. So Jesus' remarks in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28 shows that it is not just looking upon a woman with lust is the, that is the problem. It is not the eye that is the problem, but it is a heart problem. It is the mind uh, problem. The lustful gaze does not create sin, but the existence of sin already in the heart of, your, of, your, of the man is the one that causes the last full uh, look. So if one were to take the commandment found in verse 29 to verse 30 literally, it makes more sense to cut off your head, is it not? <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, rather than plucking your eye or cutting off your hand, why? Because we know that the brain controls all the uh, other parts of your body, is it not? Your brain is your central processing unit. So if you want to take it literally, you might as well cut off your head, right? So obviously, you know, uh, we see um, that literal uh, interpretation of this particular command does not make sense. And even so, in the context of which we find it, Jesus here is dealing with the hearts uh, of men. But the point that we want to take back here is the radical nature of how we should try to abstain or we should try to flee away from sin. So much so that you know, it, it looks like and um, has the imagery of cutting yourself out from that particular uh, point or uh, notion. For example, if you were to go to, and you love um, you know, going to this, um, this uh, book club, for example, but then uh, you know, this book club um, you know, is practicing things that are not proper, probably you know, bordering on things that are, that, are, that are sinful in nature, but you like you know, going to that club so much because you know, you, you know the people there, you enjoy their company and so on and so forth, so what do you do, right? Do you continue to subject yourself to all these things? Or do you take a drastic step to cut yourself out from uh, things of that nature? So, you know, some, something along those lines is what I think Jesus is trying to put forth here, the radical nature of how one should try to flee away from uh, sin. All right? So one thing that uh, points out to me at least when I read this particular passage is this. Then if that is the case, a lustful gaze is equated as adultery. 
if that is the case, then is being tempted in that regards, that means I'm already sinning. So in other words, you know, we wanted to talk about quickly a basic idea, and I'm sure you all would know, temptation versus um, sin. You know, it is good to look through again and remind ourselves of the question, it is, a, it, it, is it a sin to be uh, tempted? But before we even go and answer that question, let us ask the question, what is sin? What is sin? According to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, um, you know, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. In other words, sin is basically the transgression or the breaking of God's law. And he asks the question, what are then the effects of sin? How bad can it be, right? In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and verse 2, it tells us that we are being separated away from God because of the sin that exists. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus um, our Lord. And then you ask the question, which is the main question here, how does then sin um, develop? Because the idea that we can find here in verse 27 and verse 28 uh, you know, is, is a very fine line between you know, being tempted and having that lustful gaze that equates to um, adultery. So then the appropriate question that we should ask is, you know, how then does sin develop? Does it mean that I'm being tempted, I'm already automatically sinning? Is that the case? Now, if you were to look at um, in a passage in James chapter 1, verse 14 to verse 15, it tells us this. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth um, death. So we see here, you know, in this particular passage in James chapter 1, verse 14 to verse 15. Hang on, I'm just going to turn there. James chapter 1, verse 14 to verse 15. It at least outlines to us that there's a two-stage process in regards to how sin is being given birth, or how sin becomes full grown, that it brings forth um, death. Now, the first stage involves uh, two things. That is, number one, desires. All right? And then in, in the uh, interpretation of things, the word desire here is a strong desire for something. Basically, that's what it means. And we see, you know, uh, enticement being uh, mentioned here. It also could be uh, retranslated as opportunity because enticement here also means an opportunity and encouragement to satisfy one's um, desire or said desire. So if you put it into mathematical form, we see that temptation or being tempted has something to do with the desire of which you have and the opportunity for you to act upon that desire. Now the second stage in development of sin, we see in verse 15 when it says, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown bring forth, uh, brings forth um, death. So temptation uh, only leads to sin when you yield and act upon it. When it says in verse 15, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth um, to sin. So we see, you know, um, that, it, that in order for the, the temptation to turn into sin, we need to have an extra component, and that component is the action, to act upon it. And that's where sin, um, you know, uh, comes forth. So if you put it in the mathematical equation again, sin is a uh, combination of desire, opportunity, and action. And the, and the thing is that we should not be deceived or should not be deceiving ourselves, tying this with Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, verse 28. Remember what we were talking about? Jesus is talking about the hearts of men, is it not? So sometimes when we look at passages like this, oh, you know, action, if I act upon it, then yeah, you know, I'm sinning. I didn't act upon it, but I look at that girl. Jesus himself is saying that action is really equating to being, um, you know, having adultery in your heart. And that in itself is sin. So the word action or the action that's being put forth here is not just a physical action, just like how the Jewish rabbis of old taught you know, certain, um, you know, people, uh, certain of their people that it is only unlawful when you actually act upon it, physically speaking. But Jesus goes on further to say that you know, not only just a physical act, but rather in your hearts, if you have had that kind of thoughts, that already has conceived and it is sin in and of itself. So the action here applies not just on the physical um, nature, but also in the hearts of uh, men, and also the mind and the things that you are um, thought of. And if you, know, you prolong it in that regards, that in and of itself 
um, is sin. But remember, it is not a sin uh, to be tempted. All right? And the main example that we can use is Jesus. Because if truly it is a sin while you are being tempted, then we all have no hope whatsoever. Because then that would mean that Jesus uh, you know, would have sinned. And then whatever you know, gospel message that comes with it will just be of no use, is it not? And that's why we find passages like in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, when it says, For we do not have a high priest, namely Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without um, sin. James chapter 1, verse 12 to verse 13 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot, tempt, cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So we see here, you know, temptation in and of itself is not sin, but rather the act when that temptation, that said temptation is being put forth in front of us, that is what constitutes a sin, and that, when it's full grown, brings forth um, death. And that's the point of the matter that um, I want to make here in, this, in a sense. And, um, you know, I would close here today um, in this, just these particular verses because I was trying to fit in also the next part, which is um, verse 31 and verse 32, which deals with marriage and divorce, but I found that um, I would actually run out of time, right? real, <laughs> real time. So therefore, you know, I just, um, you know, um, would just stop right and verse 30 itself. So we see here, you know, uh, brethren and friends, in that, you know, Jesus put forth a, um, a uh, what do you call that, a uh, very telling um, teaching to each and every one of us that starts from verse 21 itself, in that we have to and must guard our hearts and minds continually. That is why Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2 tells us to renew our mind Transform ourselves by what? Renewing our mind, is it not? Actually, let, us, let me just quickly go there. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Why do we need to continually renew our mind to be transformed in that way so that we can present ourselves as living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God? If we have thoughts of that nature of what Jesus has spoken in Matthew chapter 5, how then can we suppose to, to deceive ourselves that we can stand in front of God to be holy, stand in front of God to be acceptable in His sight, to worship Him in a manner that is in spirit and in truth? That is the gravity of Jesus' teaching that we find here in Matthew chapter 5. And that's what I want to leave um, you know, with you all here uh, today. Um, in the next coming uh, week, so next week is men's and ladies. And then uh, in the next uh, coming week, I believe where Quinton is taking the study. Is that right? Yeah. And then he'll continue, of course, from verse 31 onwards. Um, that's all I have for today. And uh, if I can get uh, Brother Gerald, if you would, to lead us in the closing prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you have given to us and for allowing us to be gathered here on this Wednesday evening, to be gathered here to study more from your word, dear Lord. And we are thankful for um, the lessons that have been taught tonight. And we thank you for um, Jesus and his teachings on lust, adultery, sin, and temptation, dear Lord. And we pray that um, you help us to be strong in the faith and to learn to um, take away um, sin at its root cause and to help us to be strong in, uh, in the faith and continue to be um, lights um, in the world for you, dear Lord. And we thank you at this time for Brother Haushin who's put in the effort to teach us this evening. We pray that you continue to watch over him and guide him and bless him um, in the work that he does in your vineyard here. And we pray that as we leave um, this place that you continue to watch over us and keep us safe and that we may meet again at the next appointed time. And in everything we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.